widely known as the smartest pitcher who ever lived, Greg Maddox was a god among men in his era. He was simply unplayable in his prime time. But how did he become so dangerous on the mound despite forfeiting college and going through some hurdles on his way to stardom? Well, this is the unreal peak of Greg Maddox. Growing up, it all began in Texas in 1966 when Maddox was born. His dad was a military personnel, so his family moved around quite a lot. Greg and his siblings developed an eternal love for various sports along the way. Although they played other sports like basketball, track, and football, they were hooked on baseball. Greg's mom was the first to notice his baseball obsession. Here's what she said about their love for the sport. Kids would come home from practice in the hot sun, and the first thing they would do is head outside into the yard to play more baseball in the hot sun. Moreover, in high school, Greg eventually teamed up with coach Roger Fairless and an ex-scout Ralph Madar, who helped him hone his pitching skills. The youngster, praised for being an intelligent pitcher, helped Valley High School to a state baseball championship. Championship. And guess what happened next? The Chicago Cubs quickly snatched him up and signed him to a minor league contract in June 1984 while he forfeited college. The Miners In the minor leagues, he linked up with Dick Pohl, who was also instrumental in molding him into a beast of a pitcher. Dick taught him the importance of the ground ball, which he acknowledged later, saying, Dick always told me, you don't have to strike him out, you just gotta get him out. Maddox rose through the minor league ranks with so much ease and was in the majors after two years there. Rise to his peak in 1986, he was a starter for the Cubs in five straight games and faced his brother, Mike, in the fifth game. Mike was the pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies, but in the end, Greg's Cubs ran away with an 8-3 win. Nevertheless, the majors wasn't a bed of roses for him in his first full season, 1987. He struggled to win games, recording a paltry six wins and posting a hefty 5.61 ERA. He was subsequently sent back to the minors to regain his form. It worked. The following season, he elevated his game posting an impressive 18-8 win-loss ratio and pitching with a much cleaner 318 ERA. That year, he was also an all-star for the first time. By 1989, the now 23-year-old had blossomed into the star pitcher for the Cubs, propelling his team to success by racking up 19 wins. Especially noteworthy was his win against the Montreal Expos that sealed the Eastern Division title for the Cubs. And let's not forget the following season in 1990, which he continued his epic streak of 15 wins and achieved a 346 ERA. In the 1991 season, he was at the cusp of his peak. The six-foot pitcher repeated the 15 wins of the previous season, pitching 37 times and posting a 335 ERA. But he was just getting warmed up. Maddox began the 92 season with a bang, raking in 10 wins by early July and secured a spot in the All-Star Games. However, Maddox had his sights on his first Cy Young crown as he produced a consistent performance till the end of the season, posting an immaculate 218 ERA over 268 innings. He also led the league in wins above replacement with 9.4 and was the National League wins leader with 20 games won. Unsurprisingly, he bagged his first National League Cy Young title. Despite his success, when free agency came knocking, the Cubs weren't willing to pamper him because after it seemed like he was dragging his feet with their initial offer of $27.5 million, they signed other pitchers instead. Then the Yankees waived a bumper offer at Maddox, but since this wasn't about money, he settled for a smaller deal from the Atlanta Braves. Peak years. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves pitching coach Leo Mazzoni was overjoyed to have gotten him so easily. Saying, when we signed Maddox, I didn't realize at the time he was going to be the greatest free agent signing in the history of the game. But I knew I was going to get a lot smarter real quick. Maddox's first game for his new crew was on the road against his former team, the Cubs, in Wrigley Field. He was greeted by a course of boos from the fans who were less than impressed with his switch of allegiance. Yet, he was at the top of his game, preventing the Cubs from scoring any runs for eight and a third innings helping his new team for a 1-0 triumph. 
That win set the tone for 19 more victories that regular season. At the end of the 93 regular season, he led the league with 267 innings and posted an insane 236 ERA, grabbing his second consecutive Cy Young award. At the playoffs, the Braves squared up against the Philadelphia Phillies for a chance at the World Series. First game, Maddox was absent and the Braves lost. But in the second game, he pitched seven rock-solid innings that helped the Braves tie the game. When the dust settled, though, the Phillies proved to be too hot to handle, going on a rampage and advancing to the World Series in six games. 1994 Maddox's 1994 season proved to be even better than his previous ones. Despite a lockout that forced the season to be shortened, he clocked in 202 innings to lead the league while posting a jaw-dropping 156 ERA. He struck out an impressive 156 batters and only gave away 31 walks. That's not all. Out of 25 starts, Greg Maddox finished 10 games all by himself and won 16 games in total. At the end of the season, he wasn't just good. He was 171% better than the average player in Major League Baseball. Unreal, right? As expected, Mad Dog, as he was nicknamed, nailed his third consecutive Cy Young Award. 1995. Also, even with the strike messing things up until 1995, that didn't stop Maddox from maintaining a stellar performance. He was unstoppable. He logged an insane 163 ERA. He also achieved 16 wins during the regular season, and his heroics for the Braves didn't go unnoticed as he coasted to a fourth Cy Young title in a row. Postseason time. Well, the Braves finally made it to the World Series, but they had the Cleveland Indians to contend with. A spirited showing from Maddox in Game 1 was enough to give the Braves a much-needed 3-2 victory. Greg and Atlanta went on to win the World Series title after six games. 1996 season, after another top-notch performance during the regular season, although he had loosened his grip on the Cy Young trophy, he helped the Braves to a championship series win over the St. Louis Cardinals. But in the World Series, the Braves surrendered the trophy to the Yankees. 1997. Moving on, Mad Dog showed great efficiency and precision on the mound in the 1997 season. For instance, while facing his former team, the Cubs, on July 22, 1997, he pitched in nine innings. He threw 63 strikes, struck out six players, and drew zero walks. The Braves walked away with a 4-1 win. He maintained a consistent performance throughout the season and posted 19 wins. In 232 innings pitched, he surrendered only 20 walks, out of which six were deliberate. His performance earned him a $57.5 million five-year contract extension, making him the highest-paid player in baseball at the time. At the turn of the century, Maddox continued his amazing run of form, but let's face it, he wasn't quite the beast he was in the 90s. His peak years were over. He pitched with the Braves till 2003 before returning to the Cubs in 2004. He then had brief stints with the Los Angeles Dodgers and the San Diego Padres before calling it quits at the end of the 2008 season. The end of an era. At the end of this illustrious career, he grabbed 18 gold gloves and joined Cy Young as the only MLB player in history to win 15 or more games in 18 seasons. He won four ERA titles and made eight All-Star appearances. With a 6'10 winning percentage, Greg posted a total of 227 losses and 355 career wins, placing him number eight in the all-time wins list. He's in the top 10 list of pitchers with 3,000 strikeouts and more than 300 wins. Maddox had an impressive tally of 999 walks, started 740 out of 744 games, and had 3,371 strikeouts and 4,726 hits throughout his career. Amongst other things, he's also ranked number 13 all-time with 5,008.1 innings pitched. Finally, he was an easy pick for the 2014 Hall of Fame induction with a 97.2% vote on his first ballot. So, what made Maddox special during his heyday? What made Maddox special? 
Well, while most pitchers relied on sheer speed and power, his strength lay in his precision. Although Maddox could throw 90 miles per hour fastballs, he didn't need it. Instead, he focused on controlling his pitch, making it do exactly what he wanted. Moreover, he didn't just have a couple of pitching tricks up his sleeves, he had a plethora of them in his repertoire. The circle change, the sinker, the curveball, and many more all of which were catastrophic to any batter. And guess who helped him fine-tune his deadly arsenal of pitches? It was one of his tutors in high school, Ralph Madar. Remember him? He showed Maddox the ropes when it came to the science behind pitching. Let's hear what Maddox had to say. He worked with me when I was 15 years old and he taught me that movement was more important than velocity. He helped me make the ball move and sink as opposed to seeing how hard I could throw it. I think I was fortunate to learn that lesson at such a young age. Ralph's tutelage was crucial because it shaped him into a pitcher who knew how to outsmart batters with ease. But hold up, it wasn't just about the pitches. Maddox had a deep understanding of his opponents. He achieved this through careful study of them. By watching his opponents, he can preempt their next move, confuse them with the appropriate pitch. As Warren Spawn put it, hitting is timing, pitching is upsetting timing. Maddox understood this perfectly. If you enjoyed this video about the unreal peak of Greg Maddox, check out the video on the screen now or the one we posted below because we're sure you'll like that one too. Let us know in the comments if there's another baseball player whose journey you'd like us to cover. See you there.